السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم It is uh, a pleasure to be with you all today الحمد لله you know, the Sheikh spoke earlier about New Jersey. I come from the fourth holiest city in Islam, Patterson, New Jersey. <laughs> when we talk about this idea of identity as a Muslim, for us as American Muslims, it's a little unique. It's a little unique because since 2000, since 2001, since 9-11, they have been trying to tell us who we are. Our government, think tanks across the country have spent millions of dollars trying to tell us who the good Muslims are, who the Muslims are supposed to be. And they've gotten to the point where they've attempted to dilute some of our core values. But when the question comes, what is our identity as a Muslim, the only place to look is the Quran. When we look at the Qur'an and the, the brother recited earlier the ayah when he said, O you, who have, o you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice. If you want to understand your identity as a Muslim, this is the ayah. That we stand for justice no matter who it is for or who it is against. That is our role as Muslims. But as American Muslims, there's an added level to that. And that comes from our privilege. And that's one of the first things we need to understand is that we do have privilege here as American Muslims. We do have a privilege. We live in the world's biggest superpower. We live in the country that causes the pain that we've been talking about all day. And when we look at the history of Islam, the history of our pious predecessors, we see that they had a, a different attitude when it came to justice. We see that when they lived in times like ours, and we live in very troubling times, no matter where we look, our brothers and sisters, whether they are here in America, whether they are in Palestine, whether they are, they are in the Congo, whether they are in Sudan, no matter where we look, and the list goes on and on. They're dealing with strife, they're dealing with issues. And we as an American Muslim community, we have, we have our own issues. But we still have that level of privilege. But historically, our scholars, our pious predecessors, what they would do is in these moments, they would stop what they deemed wasn't necessary and they would focus on justice. When we talk about our prized predecessors, when we talk about Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, Nur al-Din Zanki, Umar al-Mukhtar, Izz al-Din al-Qassam, these were all people, all people who had the opportunity to become some of the most renowned scholars of their times. They were all students of knowledge and they gave that up. They gave that up so that they, because they saw that there was another need. They saw that there was a political need. There was a community need that they needed to fulfill. And we see the efforts and the results of their efforts. These were all people who took different roles because of what the community needed. And we as a community now, as an American Muslim community, when we see these issues, we shouldn't be saying, I don't want to work with these people. I don't want to work with other people. No, we should be saying, we should be leading these movements. When the streets, when people are taking the streets for the issues, for Black Lives Matter, for Palestine, for incarcerated people's, uh, for incarcerated people's rights, we should be the front. We should be at the forefront of these movements. And historically, we as American Muslims have been in the civil rights movement. The greatest leader, 
The greatest Muslim American leader at the time was leading this movement. Our brother, Malcolm X, our pious predecessor. When the students encamped and protested against apartheid South Africa, the MSAs were a part of that. The Muslim students were a part of that. They were leading that. Some of our shiuch here were a part of that. So when we see these issues, we should be thinking to ourselves not, oh, how can I stay away from this? No, we should be thinking to ourselves, how can I be a part of this? How can I lead this? And when we get the example, when we get these examples of the people who, you know, I don't want to go to encampments. Brothers and sisters, encampments aren't the end all of our activism. They're not. Not at all. And we as a Muslim community have been leading this work. Have been leading this work. This year, the largest protest in the history, in the history of this country for Palestine, had 400,000 people. Who did that? The organizations who led that was American Muslims for Palestine, was ICNA, was YM. We led that. We brought that. And when we, when we talk about the other efforts that have been taking place in recent months, just a few weeks ago, our community, the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations, which encompasses all of our community organizations, encompasses all of us, the mass, the ikna, the care, all of them were a part of this. 700 people took the capital. 700 people took the capital, went into multiple offices, all these offices advocating for Palestine. And for a more local example, how many of us, or who here knows who the first governor to call for a ceasefire was? The first governor of which state called for a ceasefire? The first governor to call for a ceasefire was Governor Westmore of Maryland. And why did he call for a ceasefire? Why did he call for a ceasefire? Because this community, the Baltimore Muslim community, specifically the Islamic Society of Baltimore, when he said, I want to come visit your masjid for Ramadan, they told him, brother, how are you going to come if you haven't called for a ceasefire? The weekend before he came to the masjid, the weekend before he came to the masjid, he called for a ceasefire. And he was the first governor to do so. And after him, they started falling like dominoes. They started falling like dominoes, ya sheikh. We had the governor of California, the governor of New Jersey. It wasn't, it wasn't where we see the large Muslim populations, not in Illinois, not in New Jersey. No, the first one was here. That's the power our community has. We bring 400,000 people to Washington, D.C. to march for Palestine. We, we bring almost 1,000 people to the capital to advocate for Palestine. We, we are the ones who force our elected officials to understand, to understand that they cannot get away and they will be held accountable for what they do when it comes to Palestine. And we have that power for every other issue we care about, brothers and sisters. Now, in a moment like this, brothers, we have many people who say, oh, I don't want to be a part of something because it's led by non-Muslims. Well, brothers, if you want to be a part of something, if you believe, if you believe in the, in, in the movement for black lives, if you believe in the Free Palestine movement, if you believe in helping the people in supporting the people of Syria, brothers and sisters, you can start in your masjid. If you don't want to work with anyone else, start in your masjid. It is that simple. Your masjid, your masjid is the one who gets the call saying, hey, I want to come visit. I'm an elected official. I want your votes. I want to come. You could start right there. Your masjid is the one who deals with the police. You could start right there. The same police that have dealings with the Israeli military, that have dealings uh, where they incarcerate Muslims and uh, our black brothers and sisters unfairly. These are the relationships you get just from your masjid. Just from your masjid. And then of course we have our own organizations. 
You know, many of us, we say, oh, I don't want to go there. They don't understand Islam. Brothers and sisters, you have American Muslims or Palestine. Brothers and sisters, you have the ICNA Council for Social Justice. You have your pick, your pick of what you want when it comes to activism, when it comes to working for Palestine, when it comes to working for these issues. There is no excuse for us to ignore our role just because we don't want to work with other people. Work with your own people. Work with your own people. And for those of us who would rather work on our own, there are a few, few main things I would suggest. The first thing is educating ourselves. You know, the idea of, of education is, is paramount to activism. When we say that we want change, when we want change, change comes when you learn. When we understand, and I'm not saying brothers and sisters, anyone should be trying to get a PhD in, in Palestinian studies right now so that they could go join a protest. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, brothers, is we need to know what's going on. This week, there's been so much news. The ICC information that came out. Uh, the ICJ ruling that came out. These are things we should be aware of. That we should be seeing on the, on the internet and taking for ourselves. We should be understanding this stuff. We should understand what the importance of 1948 meant to Palestinian people. We're in the month of May. What does that mean? What does the Palestinian catastrophe? I mean, these are things we could figure out on our own, brothers and sisters. And by having that basic knowledge, basic knowledge, it changes things. There was a report that came out a few years ago that said the more Americans learn about Israel, the less they like it. When... When I talk about education, education isn't just so I have some good information to talk about at the halaqa or to talk about when I'm hanging out with my friends later on in the night. No, this information is for us to share with those who don't know. We must let our friends, our families, those who aren't in tune with what's going on know. And that's why social media, that's why they want to close down the TikTok. That's why they want to close down the TikTok because we're sharing this information and we're educating people. It's gotten to the point where, where the, Israeli, the former Israeli ambassador to America said that he gave up on America's youth. That he gave up on the, not just the broad youth, he gave up on the Jewish youth. Because this education makes a change. And this goes for everything. We need to understand, you know, what role does the police have in my state? What role does, uh, does my governor have in what's going on? And then the next, the next thing, and the most important thing, and we're talking now in an election year, and what I'm saying doesn't require you to vote, but it requires you to understand. And that is to be a conscious constituent. Now what do I mean by that? We as American Muslims have a privilege that many of our brothers and sisters do not have. And that is that our country affects what is going on everywhere else. To put this into perspective, brothers and sisters, you know when October 7th started, I was going around to Masajid and I was speaking to communities and the first question I would always get, it would say, brother, why is Saudi Arabia not doing anything? Why is Qatar not doing anything? Why is this country not doing anything? Why, why can't they do something, brother? And I would think to myself, brothers and sisters, if you only understood what role these countries had. Brothers and sisters, these countries, some of the richest countries in the world, pay millions of dollars, millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars to talk to the people that we don't even know represent us. There was a report that came out that there was about $2 million spent lobbying a specific senator. Now this senator, for a fact, has more than 100,000 Muslims in his, in his state. And when we meet with him, we don't have to pay anything. They're paying millions of dollars. Out these countries that we want to do something are paying millions of dollars to meet with the people that we don't even know, that represent us, that are elected to represent us. So the first thing that we need to understand, brothers and sisters, is who represents us? What roles do they have? And some of the 
biggest communities of this country, whether it's Illinois, New Jersey, they have some of the most important representatives, people who affect change. And many of us in an election year, we think that it's just about Biden and Trump. But that's not how American government works. That's not how American government works. And even if we wanted to ignore the federal part of it, our states, brothers and sisters, our governors have direct relationships with Israel where they do millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in trade. Where we have our own states that have Israeli advisory boards. Over 30 states in the United States have anti-BDS bills that in one way or another try to find a way to criminalize you or stop you from boycotting Israel. These are local issues, brothers and sisters, and these are relationships that we can affect on a local level through our message, through our communities, through our communities. And what we have going for us, brothers and sisters, is you know what? We might not be the largest community in the United States, but we are a community that has a lot of effect. Brothers and sisters, us to see the change we want, we need to be, uh, we need to be willing the hardship. We need to be willing to understand that this isn't going to be easy. Many of the brothers and sisters, they uh, they tell me, they say that you know I, I can I can only do this much because I have other priorities. And that's understandable. There are many people who think that the only way to serve Palestine is to change their career, is to become a political analyst is to become a, uh, a lawyer or something like that. No, brothers and sisters, you can serve Palestine in everything you do. Everyone is capable of serving Palestine in whatever they do. Through our doctors, through our doctors, our doctors who have gone to Gaza. Many of them, American doctors, were stuck. And many of these doctors, they're Muslim Americans. Dr. Adam and a few others who I won't name. Are Muslim American people who go to our communities, people who pray in our masjid. There are ways to serve Palestine in everything you do. You don't need to change. You don't need to change anything. You don't need to change your career. You could study whatever you want. You could study the political science. You could study law. You could study medicine. You could study uh, art history. Anything you do, brothers and sisters, anything you do, brothers and sisters, can be brought to back, back to Palestine. But the main thing to understand is we can't just come and want to support when things are easy. The Quran tells us, the Quran tells us, The Quran tells us that the people think that they would be allowed to just say we believe and that they wouldn't be tested. Brothers and sisters, it's not enough to just say free Palestine. It's not enough to just say that we want to see peace for our brothers and sisters in Sudan. We want an end to the genocide in the Congo. It's not enough to do that, brothers and sisters. We will be tested on it. We will be tested on it. And in these moments, brothers and sisters, we are facing some of the hardest tests that our community can deal with. But in these moments, we think about the teachings of our Prophet and the teachings of the Qur'an. And we look back and we understand that justice will be served. Justice will be served no matter what, brothers and sisters. There's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. where he says the arc of the moral universe is long, but it always bends towards justice. It always bends towards justice. When I hear this, I think of the act that was recited a little bit early, er, earlier. The Quran tells us after A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan al Rajeem, Ala inna nasra Allahi qareem. Justice is coming, brothers and sisters. Justice will come, walau kariha al qadimu, walau kariha al kafiru. Justice will be there no matter who stands against it, brothers and sisters. But the question is, Will we be amongst those who are considered the ones who try to achieve that justice? Brothers and sisters, and I'll end with this insha'Allah. Palestine will be free insha'Allah. I see it like I see you all today. 
But the question is, brothers and sisters, when we answer to Allah about the genocide that we saw for the past eight months now, when we answer to Allah for what they have done to Masjid Al-Aqsa, for what they are doing to our brothers and sisters, will we be able to say that we did our part? We ask Allah to make us of those who will always do what they can for justice, for justice and peace. We ask Allah to make us of those who will see the liberation of Palestine and to be able to pray two rak'ahs in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Jazakumullahu khairan.